One minute, Vyom. Uh, let Kamal sir come in. Uh, sir, uh, Mohit sir, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah I am very uh, much here. Yeah, Vyom, please, please do the count. Yeah, I am there only. Vyom? Is it back? Yeah, please, Vyom, start. Okay, welcome friends. Uh, very good evening to all of you on the PG Track program of Delhi CSI. And we are into the 55th webinar consecutively have been providing you with some of the most exotic, you know, most, most wanted lectures and the best of the technology across the country. Today we are going to talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and we have uh, our dear friend Dr. Thomas Sharma who has spoken to us earlier and he was also. And uh, I would request uh, Dr. Smoo to please welcome uh, Dr. Kamal and start the session. And in case you have any questions, comments, or any clarifications, please write to us in the chat box. We'll be very happy to answer them. I also welcome my colleagues, Dr. Sumod Kurian, who is Professor of Cardiology, and Professor Girish MP, who is also Professor of Cardiology in GE Pant Hospital. Thanking Intas for providing this platform. Over to you, Dr. Sumod, to please start the session. Yeah, once again, a very warm welcome uh, for this uh, PG Track program. And we are really happy to have uh, Professor Kamal Sharma amongst us. Uh, Sir has already taken very interesting sessions on acute rheumatic fever, uh, approach to valar heart disease previously, and we all have enjoyed uh, such teaching. And it is uh, again, you know, we all look forward to hear from Sir, uh, you know, how to approach a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Sir is a senior interventional cardiologist uh, at the uh, UN Meta Institute of Cardiology, uh, Ahmedabad. And Sir is a great teacher, and we welcome you, Sir. Please uh, come and teach us on the clinical approach to HCI. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, um, uh, Dr. Smooth, for kind introduction, Professor Mohit, uh, Professor Girish. Um, uh, thank you, CSI, for uh, Delhi Branch, for giving this opportunity to me. Uh, so today, uh, I'll be talking about HOCM, clinical approach to a case, and we'll try to cover everything that is possible in an hour, including Viva Voki. So can I uh, be allowed, be allowed to allowed right now? Right, so uh, so basically, let's start with the history, and I'm not just going to talk about clinical features per se. I'll be we'll be discussing, of course, clinical features, but most of the Viva Voki, of course, they uh, move around the clinical perspectives and the other aspects of management strategies that one need to know about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It was first described by Thierry in 1958, where we found a massive hypertrophy of septum in a small cohort of young patients who had sudden death. And Brunwald was the first to diagnose it clinically in 60s. And that's why we know now um, a lot of names that are associated with this disorder includes uh, Brunwald's uh, name itself. So many names in the disease have been given, which is IHSS, as it was initially known as idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis, uh, muscle subaortic stenosis. And of course, we all know there's Hokama, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now let's talk about the facts in general, and then I'll go to very specifics. The, it's one of the most common, uh, the, the commonest cardiovascular genetic disorder, which has got heterogeneous clinical expression with mutations in genes encoding uh, all the possible proteins that we are aware of in a cardiac sarcomia. Most common cause of sudden death in young, including those in competitive uh, sports or athletics. And the male to female ratio is one is to one. So there is no genetic preponderance with regards to the gender. But of course, there is a huge genetic predisposition of 50% inheritance. So uh, this itself is a, actually a risk factor for development of atrial fibrillation. So when we talk about risk factors for AF, apart from hypertension, LA enlargement, and age, as we know, uh, HOCM itself is a big risk factor for atrial fibrillation. Heart failure-related disability, of course, can proceed and virtually can happen in any age. Um, there are, of course, certain variants, as we know, the apical uh, variant of HCM, which is predominantly found in country-wise in Japan. As it is mentioned, the literature shows that it is preponderant in Japan. Now, prevalence is something that has been changing of late. People previously used to, as we used to remember when we were residents, we used to remember one in 500. So people prevalence uh, uh, general of HOCM determined by echocardiographic in various ethnicities was 0.2%. But however, now the newer genetic assessments, cardiac MR, etc., have helped in diagnosing HCM phenotype more often. And in addition to epidemiologic studies that uh, did not take account the autosomal transmission of HCM, 
uh, with often multiple affected family members uh, of the each proband itself. Now we know that the HCM in general population is estimated close to one in 200 patients, which is like 0.5%. So this is what has changed in prevalence from 0.2% to 0.5%. Uh, it's defined as a genetically determined heart muscle disease which is most often, which is in 60 to 70% caused by mutation in one of the several sarcomere genes, which encodes components of the contractile apparatus. And depending on part upon the site and extent of hypertrophy, patients with HCM can have either LV outflow obstruction with or without diastolic dysfunction, with or without myocardial ischemia, and of course, almost always echocardiographically diagnosed mitral regurgitation. This is a famous picture from Brunwald's textbook of cardiology. And this is the histology as we see the myocardial fibro, uh, fiber disarray, which is histologically very often seen. One of the mechanism of ischemia or the angina is the compression and the medial hypertrophy of the coronary is embedded in the muscle itself. Uh, on top of that, there is huge amount of fibrotic tissue, which ensues and is present in the myocardium and uh, in between the myocardial cells. And this scarring is what makes it different and separate from disorders like aortic stenosis. A lot of genetic studies have been done, and we now know a lot of genes that are responsible and have been identified. But very importantly, no specific mutation or what is called as variant of uncertain significance is still constituting majority of the cases as is seen in the Marin series here, 65% actually don't have any mutation diagnosis or which is called as a variant of uncertain significance. You have some gene, but you don't know whether it has got any significance or not. But amongst those who have a identifiable and most likely to have uh, disorder includes MYBPC3, which is constituting 16% of the all comers, and uh, this is the mutation which is commonest uh, and is present on cardiac myosin binding protein C, while uh, that of the MYH7 uh, is the second most frequent, which is myosin heavy chain, uh, is around 7%. So it's autosomal disorder with 11 identifiable gene, uh, autosomal dominant with 50% hence of the chance of inheritance. Between the two, the beta myosin heavy chain and myosin binding protein C, they constitute of all the identifiable mutations 70%. And genotypes, however, can be identified, as I mentioned, in only 35%. So 65% of the cases uh, who are phenotypically HOCM are not uh, having any variant of uh, known significance present, and they are called as VUS. Severe course uh, is more often found in thick filament mutation as compared to thin filament mutation. So thick filament mutation are the these two mutation, beta, myosin, heavy chain, and myosin binding protein C as compared to say troponin mutation or Z-disc mutation or those mutations in those fibers, they are more likely to have benign course. There is one mimic that sometimes a DM cardiology resident should know, which is called as LAMP2 cardiomyopathy. It is not HOCM per se. This is a genetic disorder which mimics HOCM, which is usually lethal uh, and people don't survive even post ICD beyond 25 years of age. Why they need to be identified genetically? Because the only treatment in them is early heart transplant. Now, coming to natural history, there have been various series, and there is one series from India as well. Um, we'll talk about each of them as we proceed. So, Marin uh, et al. is the commonest and the oldest and the most quoted series that we know, which is easy to remember. 1% per year in adult HCM and 2% per year for children. That's the mortality that you can expect in HOCM. Uh, Harderson's data actually talks about mean age, which is 28 years, with 1,6 dying of sudden cardiac death. 10 to 15 percent of heart failure, 3 to 4 percent they develop burnout, which is called as uh, a burnout at CM, which is the diastolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, or dilated cardiomyopathy like picture in with the hypertrophied muscles around. So these patients have annual mortality of 3 to 4 percent, and patients who have aborted sudden cardiac death, mortality instead of 1 percent becomes 11 percent per year. So Nishimura's data again described role of dual chamber pacemaker. He was the first one to talk about pacing in HOCM. Of course, we will touch upon as to where it has a role now. Amaran's again data talked about myomectomy, and then the, they, they talked about 85 percent uh, even uh, symptom-free survival at 25 years age. And this is uh, the most robust data that any therapy has. And that's, this is based on Marin's data that myomectomy comes as the forefront of management strategies. Agrawal's meta-analysis of comparing 
Alcohol septal ablation versus myomectomy has shown that the alcohol septal ablation leads to higher residual gradient, more RBBB, complete heart block, and need for pacemaker with no difference, however, in mortality or in BIG class. So that's the difference between the two regimes and therapies, how they've been analyzed so far. Coming to pathophysiology and evaluation, we must know the common pathologic disorders that are present with HOCM. Subaortic obstruction is usually due to the systolic anterior motion of mitral leaflet uh, contacting the ventricular septum in the mid-systole due to the drag effect, which was previously called as venturi effect. But if you go through current textbooks, including Brunwald's, they don't mention venturi effect. It's a drag effect rather than venturi. Rather than sucking, it is actually moving in or uh, forcefully going through, being dragged into rather than being pushed, uh, being pulled into, uh, which is responsible for the obstruction. So there are multiple for morphologic abnormalities that coexist in LVOT and the mitral valve area, which are responsible for the SAM septal contact. Firstly, is the narrow diameter of the LVOT due to increased septal thickness itself. Apically positioned popillary muscles that titter the mitral valve plane towards the ventricular septum and a disoriented attachment or origin of the papillary muscle. You also, we also, these patients, we, we find elongated anterior mitral leaflet, restricted mobility of posterior leaflet, and hence longer distal point of coaptation. And of course, some patients have congenitally anomalous anterolateral papillary muscle insertion directly into the anterior leaflet, which itself may be responsible for additional mid-cavity obstruction. And uh, hence, these all factors are responsible, not just the SAM alone. These all together constitute uh, the, uh, the possible reasons why the LVOT obstruction comes into play in HOCM patient. The magnitude of this obstruction is directly proportional to the time for which the AM will is in touch with an IVS. So mitral valve apparatus, as I mentioned, these are the pathophysiological abnormalities which we had discussed. Um, the SAM of the mitral leaflet also results in the posteriorly directed MR. That's the difference because the anterior leaflet gets dragged and hence the MR is directed more posteriorly. And it's hence imperative to evaluate by trans uh, esophageal echo if required in a patient who's being planned with invasive septal reduction since this may require repair as well at the time of gradient. So patients undergoing myomectomy will always have a TE probe inside and there's no surgery in myomectomy that you can finish without a TE on table. Now, dynamic nature of LVOT obstruction, this is something that is very often asked. What are the inducers? What are the worsteners? Or what are the factors that improve or uh, cause dynamic nature of the LVOT obstruction to increase or decrease? So inducing and increasing LVOT obstruction, it can be increased by the three important factors as we know either when you reduce the preload. So basically all of them are determined by smaller LV cavity and increased force of contraction. So in smaller LV cavity can happen by either reducing preload or reduction in afterload. And hence nitrates, ACE inhibitor, ARB or CCBs, which are responsible uh, uh, respectively for reducing preload and afterload, all of them will actually worsen LVOT obstruction. And hence these therapies are recommended um, the dihydropyridine or not recommended dihydropyridines in these group of patients, unless patient develops burnout phase or di dilated cardiomyopathy, in which case you might have to use these drugs. Increasing the inotropy itself increases the force of contraction and hence can worsen the LVOT obstruction because further increasing the drag effect. So digitalis and IV inotropes can also increase the LVOT obstruction. Preload is reduced by other factors like dehydration, sudden change in posture like standing, Valsalva maneuver, amyl nitrate, which is not available in India, of course. Increased inotropy can happen with fever, uh, exercise, isoproteinolol, dobutamine infusion, post extrasystolic potentiation. So this post extrasystolic potentiation, as we know, the increased LVOT gradient and reduced aortic pulse pressure caused by post extrasystolic potentiation, as we know, is called as Bronwald Brokenborough marrow sign or phenomena. So uh, coming to dynamic auscultation and understanding the nitty gritties as to what happens with various maneuvers on the size of the chamber. So LVOT, as I mentioned, obstruction can be reduced or eliminated by increasing the chamber size or medication that reduce the force of contraction. Now squatting or lying, which is uh, uh, with the leg elevated will increase the venous return. And hence, because of increased venous return, couple of cycles later, the blood will also go into the LV, and hence the LV size will increase. 
Isometric hand grip exercise will increase the afterload. So increase systemic vascular resistance, increases the aortic pressure, and hence, in a couple of cycles later, will cause increase in the LV diameter and hence reducing the obstruction. So all the maneuvers that result in increased LV cavity and reduce LVOT obstruction will lead to uh, 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 improvement in the LVOT gradient. Drugs that reduce the inotropy are one that we use in therapy, which is beta blockers, diltiazem, verapamil, and disoparamide. So uh, dynamic auscultation, if you are not somebody who's too keen to comprehend uh, the rapid dynamics, then there is a general dictum which we all used to read long back uh, in our medicine days, that all murmurs decrease except HOCM and MVP on Valsalva and standing that practically covers everything. So HOCM and MVP will increase on Valsalva and standing, rest all murmurs won't. So this is a general dictum to remember and comprehend if you're not uh, are trying to you know understand or conceptualize the whole con the concept of preload and afterload. But I first explained the concept and then I've mentioned the dictum. <clears throat> Coming to the variants of HOCM. So there are a lot of variants that can be found. Uh, first, of course, uh, is the asymmetric hypertrophy, as we are seeing, which is defined as IVS PW ratio more than 1.3. Then patients can have sigmoid septum, which is more common in the older patient. Or patients can have mid-cavity hypertrophy, which is associated with mid-cavity obstruction. A lot of them will have papillary abnormal insertion. Free wall hypertrophy is an unusual pattern, which unlike uh, what is found in typical uh, asymmetric hypertrophy. You, patients in the burnout phase can have LV thinning, which is associated with low ejection fraction. There are apical variants, whereas there is apical hypertrophy, uh, which is, as I mentioned, more commonly found in Japan. And severe concentric hypertrophy with cavity obliteration is another variant. Biventricular hypertrophy, as I as we all know, 10 to 15% can have RVOT obstruction also, which needs to be ruled out in patients with HCM. And mild to moderate symmetric hypertrophy, which is early disease, may also be another variant that can be picked up. But remember, none of them is considered specific. IVS uh, is common variant, but A ASH is not pathognomonic as previously was considered for the same. On top of that, we have non-obstructive HCM, which is almost 10% of the patient will have gradient less than 30 at rest, and this may have class 3 and 4 symptoms. So even that does not rule out uh, that the patient is not having a severe disease. Non-obstructive patients are actually five times less likely to progress to 3, class 3, 4, but they are more likely to stay benign, but then they may be early also, early, early presentation also, they, you, or you can have a dynamic obstruction, which needs to be brought out. So non-obstructive HCM, uh, can account for one third of asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic cases. And that's why when you find an abnormal ECG, keep your suspicion for non-obstructive uh, HCM uh, very strong. Coming to signs and symptoms, uh, the symptomatology primarily. So most of these patients, uh, uh, they have variable presentation. They're not, uh, there is not a, a strong correlation between the obstruction, hypertrophy, and the symptomatology. Patient can have mild obstruction. And as I mentioned, in non-obstructive also, 10% can have class 3, 4 symptom. And there are patients who have extreme obstruction. They may be asymptomatic. And that's why, because the disobstructions are most of the times very dynamic in nature. So while many patients are asymptomatic, usually dyspnea on exertion, fatigue, angina, Pre-syncope and syncope and palpitation are the uh, predominant symptoms that the patients can encounter. Sometimes orthopnea may be present. Palpitation is usually because of atrial fibrillation or ventricular reactive But PND is uncommon because as we all know, PND um, uh, 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 during sleep, the heart rate is likely to go down. Lesser the heart rate, more is prolonged is the diastole. More is the diastole, more better is going to be filling. Force of contraction is also going to be uh, lesser, and hence the likelihood of development of dyspnea in sleep is pretty low in patients with HCM. The mechanisms that are responsible for heart failure are sometimes very often asked in the exam as to why these patients develop when they have good systolic function, where they have ejection fraction in the range of 70s and 80s, uh, 80s, why do they actually end up with dyspnea? So 90% uh, of the symptomatic patients 
Uh, they are primarily driven either by diastolic dysfunction due to myocardial hypertrophy or impaired LV emptying due to obstruction resulting in increased LV and diastolic pressure. Also, there is good amount of substantial MR and systolic dysfunction, of course, can later all supervene. All of them can actually be responsible for development of heart failure with PND and orthopnea being uncommon because, as I mentioned, PND is more determined by the sleep time when the heart rate is slow and uh, the filling is more appropriate, force of contraction is less. Angina is present in one-third of the patients, one-fourth to one-third of the patients, and this is usually despite normal angiogram. The cyst angina is most commonly precipitated and worsened by meals. That's how it's different from the most of the other angina. It's often an angina which is worsened by nitrates because nitrates reduce the preload and reduction in preload will cause smaller size of the cavity and smaller the cavity, more is likely to be a hypoperfusion of the coronaries and the obstruction being increased and hence the forward output is reduced and the muscle ischemia is more likely to happen. And these all will cause worsening of ischemia. So one of the places where nitrates are contraindicated in angina is HOCM. Induced by an increase in myocardial oxygen demand and reduction in flow and oxygen supply is another mechanism. So demand supply mismatch, as it is called. Medial hypertrophy, as I mentioned, of histology, of small lumens itself can be causing ischemia to the muscle. And patients with HCMF can have acute ST elevation appear um, uh, more likely to present with NSTMIs rather than STMIs. Coming to examination, Classically, the carotid pulse is described as bifid or often called a spike and dope pattern. It quickly, the first output represents a short upstroke, and then the second output is once the obstruction is overcome by the LV, represents the dome. JVP usually would show a prominent A wave. Remember, the A wave in the JVP is primarily because of the burn heme effect, the ventricular septum bulging towards the RV, and hence causing the A wave to become prominent. A pical impulse is usually described as double or triple ripple. Triple ripple is the two contractions of LV and one forceful contraction of the uh, uh, of the hypertrophied LA. So these three constitute the so-called one contraction of the LV impex, followed by overcoming of the obstruction and second part of the cystic, the same mechanism which comes into play for the uh, bisphariance nature of the pulse. Um, and then the LA contraction itself can sometimes be palpable parasternally, giving rise to a triple ripple uh, at the apex. Uh, fourth, heart sound is S4 is very common. S3 is very rare because of the hypertrophic nature uh, of the disorder. Only when the DCM supervenes dilated cardiomyopathy that the S4 can be present. So, uh, as I said, S3 is almost never present. Apex beat is heaving. There is presence of medium pitch systolic ejection murmur at the left a lower sternal border in apex, which varies in intensity with magnitude of subaortic gradient, and it will increase with valsalva and standing, but decrease on supine and isometric hand grip exercise. Murmur of at least grade three by six are likely to have LVOT gradients of more than 30. So if you find a murmur, then the gradient is usually more than 30 because the gradients below 30 usually don't give rise to an audible, clearly audible grade three murmurs. So pulses, uh, again, may rise uh, rapidly with the bisphariance contour, which is called a spike and dome. Usually, in almost all patients of HOCM, it is always uh, recordable. But it may or may not be palpable in all cases of HOCM. But when it is present, uh, it's again uh, uh, helpful, apart from the other cause of a bisphariance being uh, presence of moderate AS in uh, view of severe AR. So you have huge volumes and coming at some amount of obstruction which needs to be overcome. And that's how the patient can all, um, a moderate AS, severe AR can also present with uh, pulse bisphariance. How to investigate a patient? Now, I've kept uh, a halter ahead of ECG in my presentation because to in, uh, specify and stress on this topic, these patients need, uh, the, the, the most likely mode of death is an arrhythmic death. And that's why it's important that any patient of HOCM is not missed out on uh, ambulatory ECG monitoring, whether it's a halter or maybe a loop recorder. So minimum 24 to 48 hours of HCM patients should be undergoing this. If you find out uh, ectopic load or atrial fibrillation, then we know that how to approach them and treat them. Non-sustained VT is associated with increased risk even in asymptomatic patients. 
Other thing that sometimes is recommended is exercise testing, though some of the protocols mention them as a relative contraindication. However, it's not such a bad, bad contraindication to have. Um, you can actually end up doing a controlled exercise treadmill in patients with HOCM to risk stratify them, especially looking at their blood pressure response or assessing the OT, LVOT gradient by doing a stress echocardiography simultaneously. So initial exercise testing should be performed prior to the therapy and then on follow-up testing on treatment can also be indicated. During exercise, some patients can develop angina with marked STT changes, atrial fibrillation, hypotension, large gradients, and even called conventricular arrhythmia. So these stress tests need to be very cautiously be done. Normal blood pressure response to maximum upright exercise testing includes at least 20 millimeter increase in systolic pressure from peak. However, in HCM, the classical response in 20 to 40% maybe, they don't have rise in blood pressure. And this is actually representing an impending failure that may set in in these group of patients. So clinically important findings during exercise testing would include symptoms, which is dyspnea angina palpitation, increase in the gradient, fall in or failure to rise the blood pressure, development of arrhythmia, severest depression, and increase or severity of mitral regurgitation. So there are certain mimics of pressure gradient that can be found out uh, by induction of pressure gradient, which can be done, which is one of them is exercise echocardiography using a standard symptom limited protocol, uh, in which can you can assess whether the gradient has increased or not. Otherwise, of course, patients can go a pharmacological um, intervention to evaluate worsening of gradient, which includes amyl nitrate, dobutamine, isopretrolol, valsalva maneuver, while doing, doing an echo. Sometimes you can look at the gradient when the patient is supine versus immediately keeping the probe and asking the patient to stand up and then see if the gradient has changed. Other thing is to ask the patient to raise leg and see if the impact of increased venous return. Or the other aspect is to give sublingual um, so, um, uh, glycerin dinitrate, sorbitrate. Um, so all these various techniques can be done, but a simple baseline echo alone may not be sufficient, especially from a DM cardiology. You should always try to look whether the gradient is provocable. However, despite the presence of LVOT, there is not a predictable correlation between symptoms and the gradient, as we all know. So LV echocardiography would show uh, LV hypertrophy. Uh, previously, it was called as 18, and then, of course, it has been revised many years back. Now, the HCM is confirmed when wall thickness is more than 15, and a wall thickness more than 13 may also be considered as HCM when there is a family member who had history of HCM. So in a family member, cutoff is 13. In an un, uh, no genotypic history available, then it is 50, uh, 15. With genotypic, it's 13. So most common LVH, of course, is the basal anterior septum uh, in continuity with the anterior free wall with the posterior septum, uh, the third most common location. Although LVH often involves a substantial portion of LV, an important minority of HCM, which is around 10%, have increased free wall thickness confined to only one or two segment. And hence, sometimes echo can miss on picking up uh, appropriate uh, uh, diagnosis, and that's why cardiac MR have a big role to play. So presence and extent of LVH is evaluated in diastolic uh, at, the, at, the, at the time of diastole in the level of mitral valve and papillary valve. So this is another important aspect as to when echocardiography, when do you measure the thicknesses? You measure it in diastole and you measure it at the level of mitral valve and papillary muscle. Now, SAM as, uh, is to be documented. Uh, it's not a requirement for diagnosis, but it's frequent to have SAM uh, in patients uh, uh, with, with, with which positions the mitral valve within the LVOT, and it may cause, may itself be responsible for LVOT obstruction, and greater the contact, as I mentioned, higher is the uh, degree of obstruction or the gradient. So we all know that it's class 1B recommendation in HCM to do a transthoracic echo at rest, and also during Valsalva in sitting and semi-supine, and then again on standing if no gradient is provoked. So this is from the guidelines that you must do echo in two different postures in a patient who's suspected or confirmed case of um, uh, HCM. Uh, measurement of maximum diastolic wall thickness is recommended using 2D short axis in all segments. Comprehensive evaluation of diastolic function is recommended with pulse Doppler, tissue Doppler, pulmonary vein velocity, PA systolic pressure, LA size, and in symptomatic patients with a provoked and resting instantaneous gradient less than 50, you'll have to do exercise in standing, sitting, semi-prone, and to detect, detect a provocable gradient so as to know whether you're dealing with. And the reason being that the patients 
of severe disease, that is class 3, 4, or stroke in patients with LV of obstruction versus no obstruction is statistically significant. And even after myomectomy, the relief of the obstruction and normalization of pressure would actually show good survival from all cause mortality with age and gender matched population as compared to those who are not operated. 83% versus 61% at 10 years, uh, these patients can match isolated myomectomy versus expected US population as compared to those who are not operated upon. So this is how it looks like. This is a, a picture uh, of the uh, before surgical myomectomy and post myomectomy and SAM. And the SAM uh, of the mitral valve in which elongated leaflets bend sharply contacting the septum. The magnitude, as I mentioned, is directly proportional. And of course, SAM is secondarily responsible causing an MR. Subaortic gradient and systolic ejection murmur, they are reduced or abolished, as I mentioned, by by drugs which reduce the uh, myocardial contractility, which is beta blockade, increasing the volume and arterial pressure, and they are augmented by nitroglycerins and drugs, increasing contraction like dobutamine and uh, digitalis. This is how the SAM looks like. You can see the systolic, the diastole, and the cyst, then the systole, and then the systole, you can see the mitral valve uh, going ahead and touching the septum. So that's the SAM on echocardiography. These are the gradings of SAM, uh, the four grades that have been defined. These were primarily defined for anesthesia point of view for uh, other disorders, but then of course now they have been um, utilized for HOCM as well. Uh, so no AMVL, IVS contact with distance more than 10 is called grade one, less than 10 is called grade two, brief contact with less than one third of systole is called grade three, and if the contact is more than 30% of the systole, it's called as grade four. So this is how the SAM uh, is documented, we all are aware. Um, uh, this is uh, the yellow arrow in figure D, which is showing the same. Uh, and it, this is, of course, the rheumatic MS and the plateauing and the flattening to compare with how it differs versus that of the SAM uh, in HOCM. Now, sometimes ECO can actually end up, you can end up picking up a, a, a brunwald brockenberg phenomena. This is like one of our own echo images, uh, which is there um, in our book also, is one the patient was under, is, was in uh, atrial fibrillation also can actually induce a long cycle, short cycle uh, sequelae when follows. You can actually have increasing in gradient, but no increase in the pulse pressure despite post extrasystolic potentiation. Cardiac MR has now come into play in a big way. Uh, cardiac MR can identify areas of segmental LVH, not reliably visualized by ACO, as I mentioned, because in addition to detecting LVH and fibrosis, they also have additional information by picking 40% of small aneurysms that can develop in these patients and are missed on ACO. They are also a predictor and a very sensitive and specific predictor of death, sudden cardiac death. 100% sensitive is LV mass index, more than 91 for male, more than 69 for female, and a maximum wall thickness more than 30 is a very specific sign. So wall thickness is a specific sign. LV mass index is a sensitive sign on a cardiovascular MR as a predictor of sudden cardiac death. Of course, we can quantify late gadolinum enhancement, and that's a predictor of arrhythmic deaths. And uh, more than 15%, as we all know, is now considered a significant cutoff for a threshold for putting an ICD in these group of patients. Of course, it can assess RV hypertrophy, evaluate microvascular dysfunction, regional abnormality, diastolic properties, and structural abnormalities like myocardial crypts that can develop in these group of patients. Indication for cardiac death are few, which include uh, persons in whom additional diagnosis is suspected, like restriction or constriction, which is very rare. But in patients who are undergoing an invasive angiogram, you can, of course, go inside and take a look at the pullback gradients uh, to quantify the same. Uh, again, in patients whose LVOT obstruction is present, but the clinical and imaging data are discrepant, again, that's one of the indications of doing a cath. Person whom endomyocardial biopsy is planned to exclude non-sarcomeric disease, like Fabry's disease or amyloidosis or Danone disease, which is the differential diagnosis of HOCM. Uh, that's one more indication. When you suspect Fabry's or amyloid, you can go ahead and do an endomyocardial biopsy. Pre-cardiac transplant evaluation is another indication why a cardiac cath should be done in a suspected HCM. So these are the class 1 and 2B indications to evaluate right and left heart function and PVR in patients who are planned for transplant or circulatory support, but in patients with Inconclusive, non-imaging, left and right heart may be considered to assess the same filling pressure and gradient is still to be.
So this is how it looks like. We all know the spike and dome, which I talked about in the pulse uh, pattern. Um, the differences, as we, as I was discussing again in histopathology, the versus uh, valvular AS. Uh, first, it is that it is within the LV obstruction that you find as compared to at the valve. It may be variable, labile, and hence you have aortic pressure characteristics of aortic pulse, spike, and dome. The timing and upstroke of the initial LV aortic tracing are similar, but the rapid in upstroke as compared to slow upstroke in aortic stenosis. So rapid upstroke is classical of HCM as compared to valvular AS, where you find a pattern of parvacid tardus. A premature bead, of course, can distinguish the two. And this is now the broken bron 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 marrow sign. So after the third QRS, you can see that there is more time post ectopic. There is a pause and there is more time for LV to fill, which is basically increase in the preload. And we know from the Frank Starling law that the preload is going to stretch the fiber and more is the preload, more is the force of contraction. So the contraction of LV and hence the aortic and the pressure on the LV that is generated is more than the previous beats or, or the previous three beats as seen in the yellow fourth beat. But because of the dynamic nature of the obstruction, it increases more than that of the LV pressure, and this causes a fall in the aortic pressure of the LV pressure as the LV pressure rises. And this is what is called as Brownwell Brackenberg phenomena. So, though the LV force is more, but the obstruction is proportionately higher gradient, and hence you don't find the uh, uh, the rise in the aortic pulse pressure. So. Uh, the re uh, reduced compliance in the LV is also apparently uh, seen in the prominent A wave in the LV waveforms that is also present. And you can see that the systole, uh, as the systole continues, obstruction reaches a maximum in the aortic pressure, drops in the aortic pressure waveform, transform to appear similar to valvular aortic stenosis with the delayed upstroke. This pattern of initial unimpeded ejection in progressive obstruction is called a spike and dome. And this is the pathogenesis or pathophysiogenesis of spike and dome configuration in HCM, which is responsible for bifid pulse. Uh, athlete's heart is another differential that people talk about. So ECG changes, which are uh, uh, part of uh, cardiovascular adaptation in an endurance athlete, include bradycardia, increased QRS voltage, tall T, J-point elevation, U-waves, pathological Q, uh, T inversion. However, they strongly favor, uh, 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 confuse it around uh, with the HCMR, the pathological Q left axis, T inversion, etc. So findings, uh, extent and pattern of findings of the athlete's heart versus that of the uh, HCM is primarily, as we all know, the LV dimension cavity, LV uh, IVS and PW thickness, LV cavity uh, with end diastolic diameter less than 54 distinguishes HCM versus athlete's heart with 100% sensitivity. Of course, depressed E dash. Uh, or EA velocity is found in HCM in compared to normal velocities on tissue Doppler uh, from the athlete's heart are also important parameter. Cardiac MR, of course, can pick up, which I mentioned with fibrosis, et cetera, and the thickness in general. Uh, functional assessment when VO2 is done, again, we'll be able to pick up the differences between the two. So these are the important differences as tabulated in our textbooks. Uh, LV cavity less than 45 versus 55. LA enlargement present in HCM. Bizarre ECG pattern, though can happen in both, but more likely with the Q waves with HCM. Abnormal LV filling, uh, history of HCM. Uh, O2 increase by 110% only with athlete heart can happen. And gadolinium enhancement plate and atherogenic sarcoma mutations both go favor in HCM. So now I'll come to ECG, which we often do. Uh, in 90% of the probands, uh, it's always abnormal. So very unlikely you'll find an HCM patient without with a normal ECG. While 75% of even asymptomatic relatives will have an abnormal ECG. The common abnormalities, as I mentioned, include voltage changes and hypertrophy, STD changes, left atrial enlargement, narrow Q, deep Q waves, and decreased R wave with none being pathognomonic. This is how typically an HCM ECG looks like. Now, once you pick the patient or suspected a case, how do you approach a family member and how do you assess them for cardiovascular evaluation, including echocardiography or CVMR? In less than 12 years, it's optional unless you have a malignant family history, you have competitive athletic sport, which is involving intense training, or there is symptom or any other suspicion of LV hypertrophy. Otherwise, below 12 years, no need to screen first degree relative. Between 12 to 21 years, they should be screened every year to a year and a half. And more than 21 years, imaging at the onset of symptom and possibly at five-year interval, at least through middle life, 
more frequently for imaging at appropriate family members if there is a malignant family history uh, should be done. So uh, there is echocardiography. Once it is done, you don't document LVOT obstruction. If they are asymptomatic at rest, uh, um, then you need just surveillance. Mild symptomatic medical therapy, drug refractory class 3, 4 will have to undergo surgical myomectomy. Uh, in patients who are non-obstructive, of course, um, most of them mild symptomatic or asymptomatic, nothing is required beyond the same as is mentioned for the those with obstruction. But drug refractory symptoms are very rare. And in that case, transplant may be the only option. So once the longevity is looked at, a uh, patient who's got genotype positive but phenotype negative, you can just do a follow-up. No symptoms with or without obstruction, no treatment, sudden death risk, then ICD. Presence of AF, you have to give with antiarrhythmic drugs, including cardioversion, because atrial kick is very important in these patients. Heart failure symptoms, drug therapy, refractory drug therapy. We look for the uh, gradient more than 50. Then you will have to do myomectomy, first choice, second choice is alcohol ablation. But a non-obstructive with the LV dysfunction plan would be to either do a transplant or put an ICD. So beta blocker, verapamil, disoparamide are the drugs. Novel agents are being under investigated, which include primarily... Uh, allosteric myosin inhibitors, which are actually just been published in one of the trials, and it may soon come into the market. Last year, ACC, ESC, I believe, the trial was published uh, for this molecule. Pharmacological treatment with a biodiron or adder antiarrhythmic drug for prevention of sudden death um, is an obsolete strategy in high-risk patients. So radiofrequency ablation in unproven a strategy due to diffuse substrate because you can just end up scarring all of the ventricle if you try to uh, go up behind chasing the actopix. So the exceptions being the LV aneurysms with focus, which you can ablate. We all know the possible mechanism of the drugs, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, not only cause slowing the heart rate, prolong the diastole, but also increase the filling pressures. Uh, among the donned hydropyridines, verapamil is most commonly used, but DLTSM can also be used. Beta blockers can reduce angina, and cal non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, they reduce also angina by improving uh, calcium uh, impaired kinetics, which are improved by calcium channel blockers. That's one of the theory why CCBs along with beta blocker do better rather than other therapies alone. Uh, symptomatic HCM uh, with a significant history of failure, you can choose a negative inotrope. Initial monotherapy is good enough. But patients with significant history uh, uh, of heart failure and LVOT obstruction, despite monotherapy, you can go ahead and combine the two with a beta blocker and then you add a verapamil. And sometimes the three drugs have never been proven to be effective. So giving disoparamide beta blocker and verapamil simultaneously to a patient probably has no role. So disoparamide is either given either with beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. Never three together because of the side effect profile with the three drugs. Vasodilators are worsening the outcome, as we all know, and so do the diuretic should be limited. Disoparamide is otherwise a good drug, more potent negative inotropism as compared to the other two drugs, there is beta blocker. But the problem is that can cause AV nodal acceleration. And hence, if these patients develop AF, which they very often do, they will end up developing fast ventricular rate. And second is it can cause wide QT interval and hence can increase the risk of sudden death. So these are the two problems why disoparamide still continues to be as a third choice. Um, though some patients, it can be good second choice to put on. Disoparamide should not be given concurrently with amiodarone or class 1 antiarrhythmic. And it can have significant anticholinergic side effect and hence should not be given in patients who have history of retention of urine because of prostatism. In settings of acute hemodynamic collapse, this is sometimes that you may encounter. HOCM presents to casualty. The drug of choice is phenylephrine. By increasing the blood uh, pressure, uh, it's, it's given in a solution. Uh, 500 ml dextrose administered 5 to 9 ml per minute, which is like 100 to 180 drops per minute for 20 drops per ml. And it provides phenylephrine at a rate of 100 to 180 micrograms per minute. When the blood pressure is stabilized, the rate can be reduced to 40 to 60. Um, avoidance of inotropes, which may further worsen LVOT obstruction. If patients can sometimes be even short acting beta blocker like Esmolol if there is enough margin. Uh, administration of disoparamide over 4 minutes, 5 minutes is something recommended, but IV is not available in US. Uh, in select situation, uh, it's neither available in India. And less severe cases can be just managed with oral fluids and beta blocker orally. Perioperatively, these patients need a good volume preservation. They should be hydrated well. Hypotension in them would require 
uh, volume augmentation by afterload administration of alpha agonists. Uh, limiting contractility oxygen demand can be achieved by giving IV metoprolol or esmoprolol, esmolol if required and vasodilators should be avoided. Now coming to risk stratification, previously it was believed that there are uh, quantifiable scoring systems, but now those quantifiable scoring systems have very limited data to be proven as signs. Prior cardiac history of sudden death, family history of sudden death, syncope, non-sustained VT, LVH more than 30 mm, uh, LG more than 15%, LV apical aneurysm, and burned out HCM are the important predictors of sudden death. So these patients uh, are recommended either primary or secondary ICD insertion. Implantation for secondary is recommended for those who have already sustained a ventricular tachycardia or sudden cardiac death. In patients with that same with more than two major non-invasive risk marker, also some people consider it as primary prevention. So in patients with one major risk factor, but two remain ambivalent or uncertain regarding ICD, of a magnitude of the LVOT obstruction and result in enhanced contrast as CVMR imaging can help to quantify who should receive and who should not receive. So certain subset of HCM, namely end-stage HCM with EF less than 50, HCM with apical aneurysm, these are high-risk patients and they should be subjected to ICD. Uh, secondary ICD, it's now very well documented that patients with documented NSVT were more likely to develop sustained VTVF with 12 to us is 8% as compared to those that did not undergo ICD insertion. And hence, the factors associated with increased likelihood uh, would include duration of more than seven beats, rate more than 200, and more than one NSVT run. These patients should always be considered um, a choice of an ICD. Uh, atrial fibrillation is very often present in them because of the diastolic dysfunction and LA enlargement and hence the circuitous movements. Uh, predisposing factors in these group of patients include severe diffuse hypertrophy, myocardial fibrosis, impaired LA function on echocardiography, LA diameter more than 40, increasing age and presence of heart failure symptom. Uh, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers are the, the one that help in uh, controlling the rate. Digoxin should be avoided as we all know. Uh, rhythm control. Sotal all can be considered and it should be started only in indoor patients or uh, whether the patient has ICD or not because uh, they can cause significant QT prolongation and can cause sudden death. Only exception to use of Sotal all, not isoparamide, in suppressing AF would be to consider amiodarone initially in these patients for you know, long-term use of drugs in unlikely because of the patient's advanced age or short duration of antiarrhythmic, which is planned. Uh, anticoagulation for patients with HCMAF uh, uh, in chronic anticoagulation, either warfarin or analog uh, or the direct anticoagulation with an INR between two to three is recommended. Now the surgeries. Myomectomy uh, for surgical septal myomectomy is done thoracotomy uh, uh, as a procedure on CPB itself. And uh, almost the amount of muscle that is resected is nothing more than three to 15 gram. Average is eight gram of ventricular septal muscle, which is through the aorta, they approach and they aortotomy wise, whatever is coming through the orifice and they can see what is obstruction is what the surgeon chops off. Uh, too much of chopping of the myomectomy through this procedure can actually cause ventricular septal ruptures and VSDs postoperatively too little can leave a huge residual gradient and hence a very specific surgery which is best left to the best of the trained hands or experienced hand as some of the centers are. So contemporary procedure usually involves a distal extension through the base, uh, and then they uh, they can revise the mitral leaflets and caudal structure and extend the myomectomy through uh, trough, allows the release of the anterior papillary muscle, which has been trapped and often apically displaced, as I was mentioning, is one of the mechanism or obstruction in these group of patients. So combination of myomectomy trough and enterolateral papillary muscle release usually leads to a widening of LVOT and nearly complete abolition of LVOT gradient and disappearance of even mitral regurgitation without doing MV repair. Septal uh, surgical myomectomy, hence is also called as uh, septal reduction, uh, uh, which is selective as we call uh, by surgery or not selective alcohol septal ablation, which is the other alternative. So uh, Morrow procedure as it has been called after the uh, after Morrow himself, who defined these procedures long back, the muscle he removed were not more than 10 grams. And that's how the surgery is done. Through the aorta, you, uh, the surgeon enters and it resects the muscle that's coming onto the way. So problems with uh, myomectomy include development of bundle branch block. So uh, most of these patients with come back with LBBB, 
uh, because of the nearby structure resection of the fibers. Uh, and the excessive removal can cause VSR, vent ventricular septal rupture, in 2% of the patient, which is a serious complication. And intraoperative ACO, hence, is very important. Complete heart block can develop in 5% or less. And LBBB is present almost in everybody. RBBB at the baseline, hence, would be a relative contraindication of doing myomectomy because RBBB is pre-existing and you do LBBB by doing myomectomy, a patient will end up with CHB. So a patient who has got RBBB, the procedure of choice would be alcohol septal ablation. And patient who has already uh, got LBB, the procedure of choice would be myomectomy. So very rarely traction of aortic valve to improve visualization access the septum may cause aortic regurgitation and necessary valve replacement. Mitral valve repair can sometimes be performed in patients with elongated mitral leaflets. Uh, however, mitral valve replacement is a primary uh, method of relieving obstruction is now infrequently performed given the improvement of symptoms and LVO gradient, as I mentioned. And patients with HCM and refractory heart failure related to LVO obstruction who are not candidates uh, for the therapy, uh, percutaneous mitral plication may also be an effective way of reducing the gradient, uh, which is rarely used. Alcohol septal aberration, only 1 to 3 ml of 95% alcohol is injected in the first major septal branch of the LAD using a... Um, uh, 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 using a balloon, which is occluding onto it. It's a very simple procedure to do. Uh, but of course, it has got a lot of complications, which if you don't know how to handle, can end up in a big trouble. So you identify the first septal and through the balloon, uh, uh, it's a, uh, the OTW balloon, which you inflate, and on the side of it, then the uh, alcohol is injected, and that's how alcohol septal ablation is done. So it's basically one of the ethanol use, medical use of the ethanol, um, it uh, uh, causes basically necrosis. It can cause angina. Myocardial contrast echo is something that is very often used to detect and delineate the size of the muscle which has been infarcted using it. Pulse wave Doppler imaging is the method of choice and using the diluted contrast material to avoid destruction of micro bubbles with high frequency continuous wave ultrasound. 10% uh, uh, of the muscle mass is sometimes what you end up actually ablating or infarcting. So the indication for alcohol septal ablation, of course, has to be class 3, 4 symptoms with thickness more than 18 and gradient more than 50. But on top of that, there should be no papillary muscle or mitral valve uh, annual, annual, uh, uh, valvular anomalies, absence of significant coronary artery disease, compatible septal branch anatomy, and relative contraindication to surgical myomectomy. The benefits are, of course, the reduces LVOT obstruction, improves symptoms, increases exercise capacity, improved long-term survival, uh, and it's comparable both in young and old patient twisting. Uh, LVOT gradient comes down on an average from 65 to 15, while the provoked LVOT gradient decreases from 125 to 31, and there is a mean improvement from 2.9 functional class to 1.2, with further O2 consumption being increased from 18 to 22 ml, ml per kg per minute with exercise capacity also increasing. Complications include dissection, pericardial effusion, large infarction, arrhythmias, VT, and very importantly, complete heart block. So overall, the alcohol septal ablation fares slightly inferior to a good surgical hand of septal myomectomy, which has got a high uh, success rate of 90 to 95% compared to 80 to 90% of alcohol septal ablation. Three-month delay in improvement in alcohol septal ablation is actually not required because when you do a septal myomectomy, it's immediate result. There is lower incidence of CHB, better symptom resolution, greater likelihood of relief of LVOT obstruction, no risk of dissection, and ability to treat concomitant anatomical abnormalities, as I mentioned, the resection of the LVOT obstructions. Alcohol septal ablation, of course, it's non-invasive, less expensive, a uh, low chance or very small chance of VSR and short hospital stay. But of course, um, uh, the uh, higher likelihood is, uh, of course, you can do the angioplasty, but the repeat septal alcohol ablation reduction therapy for recurrent or residual symptomatic LV obstruction may be required and which is more likely to happen in alcohol septal ablation as compared to septal myomectomy, which is less than 2% for surgical myomectomy and up to 10% in patients who alco undergo alcohol septal ablation. Uh, pacemakers, by programming RV contraction, force pacing, and septum moves towards the RV during systole, resulting in widening LVOT, has been the therapy which people have evaluated. In empathy trial, they demonstrated LVOT reduction by only 50% uh, with improvement in functional capacity. Only a sub-small set 
of the older patients with localized mid-septal hypertrophy actually end up benefiting from this. And hence, bioventricular pacing, small studies have suggested possibility of CRT uh, in patients with LVOT or LBBB, and this can benefit in those subgroup of patients. But this is uh, primarily falling out of vogue with good results coming in from alcohol septal ablation or myomectomy. Uh, screening of the relatives I've already touched upon. Atrial fibrillation also I've touched upon as the amiodarone being the preferred drug. You can undergo, patient can undergo a maze procedure at the time of surgical myomectomy. This is additional thing that the, that the patient and a cardiologist should remember. The ICDs, as I was mentioning, the secondary prevention would uh, actually require that the life expectancy should be more than a year. And HCM risk SCD variables are important in determining primary prevention therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll be open to questions. Thank you, Dr. Kamal, for an exhaustive talk. Uh, comments uh, from Dr. Sumon, Dr. Girisha. Uh, yeah, Mike, uh, one of the questions to you is that it's a patient of a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is coming with atrial fibrillation. So, which are the preferred drugs that you would be happy to convert it you know, in the current scenario? You ask me or you ask yeah, me? Yeah, I'm just discussing with you. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, in the current scenario, uh, with the prolongation of QT and with COVID also coming in into a big way, mm -hmm. we we'll always be avoiding drugs like uh, the other drugs like I would, um, like propofenone or um, uh, flaconide, etc., especially in these uh, group of patients. On top of that, amiodarone is a good choice to do because most of these patients would require atrial kick to be present. Rate versus mm -hmm. rhythm, though mm -hmm. most of the trials have actually talked about uh, have been very neutral in most of the mm -hmm. non-HCM subgroups. But in mm -hmm. HCM, the atrial kick itself is an important parameter that needs mm -hmm. to be taken into consideration. So amiodarone and ibutilide are two drugs that people have a lot of times talked about. Mm -hmm. But again, we need to be very cautious. Again, other aspect being sotalol that people talk about. But again, the risk of sotalol, risk, risky, risk involved with sotalol in outpatient is very high. And sotalol should not be administered uh, in HCM patient for rate or rhythm control uh, unless the patient is in ICU setup. And they do say that uh, the patient is, according to new guidelines, the patient is already having an ICD, then uh, uh, flicanide and propofenone are, really, are a very good choice for these patients because they are already protected against the uh, ICD. ability of the yeah. pill, pill, uh, pill in pocket concept yeah, has been yeah. tried to be extrapolated in HCM mm. support, but most of the textbooks still don't mention them as the first choice. The algorithms that exist with native uh, normal heart versus diseased heart versus LV dysfunction versus HCM still talks about uh, class three drugs as uh, being utilized uh, in these group of patients. And what about the anticoagulation strategies in these patients, you know, which are the preferred ones? Required INR to be maintained between two to three. Uh, warfarin has been more studied. There is very little data that exists for NOACs. There have been small trials that have been done with NOACs in these subgroup of patients. Uh, there is no specifically designed trial only looking at HCM and AF. There have been trials of uh, non-valvular AF, which had some subgroup of patients which were of HCM. So if you believe in subgroup data and are convinced with it, then you can probably choosing a NOAC. But most of the data that exists in the literature currently is around warfarin with an INR of two to three. But uh, it will also be important to convey to our residents that uh, usage of NOAX as well as vitamin um, uh, uh, K antagonists is uh, now both a class one indication okay. for both. Yeah, and even if uh, it is very pertinent to know that uh, HOCAM patients, HCM patients on device de detection, you know, according to this third trial, there is almost fifty three percent chances that you will have some level of arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation in these patients. So all the more it becomes important whether it is detected clinic uh, this on the basis of ECG or the internal device interrogation, both uh, are an indication of class one indication for using uh, DOAX or uh, Waffen and uh, vitamin K in these patients. Dr. Small, Dr. Grish, if you have any questions. Yeah, yeah uh, Dr. Kamal very uh, uh, nicely uh, covered topic on HCM. There's one question. Uh, what about uh, the female patients of HCM who become pregnant? How do you manage them through pregnancy and through uh, the delivery? Uh, good question. So pregnancy is actually a disorder. Uh, I mean, it, 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 in the, the patients with HCM disorder, pregnancy itself is going to be 
you know, usually be well tolerated and doesn't change the outcomes in general. But of course, the problem would be to use drugs that don't impair fetal heart rate. So patients who are already on beta blockers, you need to be choosing drugs like lebetalol, which are very often used, otherwise also in pregnancy. Um, though, of course, there is theory to suggest that propanolol may do better than metoprolol simply because of unopposed alpha and yes, blocking yeah. both beta 1 and beta 2. So the more uh, non-selective theoretically you become, more likely that you will benefit uh, especially with the uh, molecules between when you have to make a choice between pro, uh, propanolol versus metoprolol. But of course, there are no trials comparing propanolol versus metoprolol. Um, um, beta blockade apart, CCBs, uh, you can choose. Again, the fetal heart rate is one issue, but you, of course, you can't be using other drugs like amiodarone, etc. Um, the increased venous return from the placental bed and the fall in the uh, PVR is actually nullified by the volume load. So that's the advantage that the pregnancy has. You have low pressure segment in the placenta, but you have higher volume load returning from the placental blood and the fetal blood, which matches and increase the LV cavity size, though there is a fall in the SVR. So fall in SVR, but increase in the volume okay. can actually compensate for the hemodynamic changes that may ensue with pregnancy and can make HCM worse. And how about delivery? What is the uh, uh, preferred... Uh, um... yes. Yes, so that's again an important thing. Uh, uh, the, the cut, cutting short the second stage of labor is what they usually talk about. Uh, because if a uh, uh, cesarean section in one and all is, of course, not recommended. Uh, doing outlet forceps is very commonly recommended in these subgroup of patients. And, uh, uh, of course, the normal labor with uh, the uh, prolonged second stage is not a good choice. Again, using drugs like vasoconstrictors, uh, actually may help in them because of the same physiologic reason because it increases SVR and can actually worse decrease the LVOT gradient. But again, it can cause also simultaneous tachycardia and can make things worse and more arrhythmogenic. Hence, shorten the second stage is the preferred strategy. Again, uh, with regards to anesthesia, which I briefly touched upon, but the short of, uh, being short of time, I tried to uh, did not cover that in detail, uh, is to avoid uh, epidural or spinal yes. because of fall in SVR uh, and these group of patients can, which can worsen. So, uh, best choices, of course, is a short GA that we usually are employed in these patients if they are undergoing a severe injection. Uh, I did not mention upon Mava Captan, which I think was uh, I mentioned the group yeah. of drugs, but Mava Captan is the new drug which is okay. being evaluated and has now been approved uh, as a cardiac myosin inhibitor. Though it's not available, but I thought for the sake of PG PG students, I should mention yes. it. And also, the uh, continuation of anticoagulation is uh, the same way as in other diseases, you know. As in other programs. If the warfarin, if the target is, requirement is less than five, then probably you have to continue the same dose throughout the pregnancy. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and the uh, is that one, one, one more uh, question usually asked in exams is uh, uh, the about the broken bone uh, more sign. So post PVC, actually there is an increase in LV size. Despite that, why there is a uh, uh, fall in uh, uh, pulse pressure? Because one would expect that the systolic pressure to be increased rather than uh, no, uh, reduction in uh, systolic pressure. Yeah, so I think it's the uh, the answer. So the, the, what examiner usually intends to ask you is two things. One, that despite the rise in the LV pressure, why the pulse pressure narrows, number one. And what is secondly, the biopathophysiological mechanism responsible for the same? Why a post-extrasystolic post potentiation, which is driven by the calcium? So when an ectopic comes, the cell is flooded with more calcium for the next cycle to have. The problem in HCM is that the calcium handling by the rhinodyne receptor complex is impaired genetically in these group of patients. So despite higher amount of calcium being present in the cytoplasm, the sarcolem, uh, uh, sarcoplasm, the cell is not able to contract as uh, efficiently, though it acts more forcefully, but not as efficiently as it would. On top of that, not only the LV pressure rises, but the amount of obstruction also rises. Because as the force of contraction increases, the uh, drag effect of the obstruction also goes up. So rather than the venturi, as I was mentioning, it's the drag effect and the LVOT obstruction, which further advances. So LV pressure, instead of, say, 150, becomes 200, but the gradient also rises from 50 to 100. And hence, the pressure 
that you will find the order of the pulse pressure would still remain either low or small as compared to what it was previously. So I think the examiner is keen to know both aspects, whether you know cyto, uh, cyto, uh, cytological level and the abnormalities that are ectopic induces and how they are impaired in a patient with HCM. And secondly, what happens to the obstruction and what happens to the LV pressures and what happens to the aortic pressure and hence the net difference being nullified and still being less. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Kamal, Dr. Kamal, when we present a case of uh, infinity obstruction like aortic stenosis, we often say you know, there is a uh, late peaking of the mama that is, uh, you know, that is uh, uh, indicator of severity. So Dr. Rahul is asking from the audience, uh, uh, we, can we uh, say you know, uh, peaking for a HSCM case also? Uh, how do you say the severity of obstruction in a case of obstruction? Yeah, so, so good question. So severity of obstruction in HCM is not determined by peaking or long length of the murmur or the intensity of the murmur. Because HCM is a dynamic uh, 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 obstruction. It is not a fixed obstruction at you as you find in aortic stenosis. The fixed obstruction is what is responsible for the late peaking because the LV contraction is still preserved and the obstruction, uh, if the more critical is the obstruction in light of that fixed obstruction, that cardiac output has to pass through that limited orifice. Smaller the orifice, more longer is the duration for which the LV ejection trying will keep on creating a gradient and hence will have a late peaking of the murmur. So the force of contraction as long as DP by DT is high, from the LV through that orifice, the more is the pressure generated, more is the ejection time, more is the late peaking, and more critical the stenosis. This is not the case in HCM because in HCM the obstruction is dynamic, and that's why you get the doming later on. The doming, the spike is of course the first contraction that's would tell you, but the doming is what will be the part of the second contraction. So the force is or the obstruction is not going to be determined either by the severity or the length or the duration of the murmur, or peaking, as they mentioned in HOCM. HOCM severity, you can simply assess. Um, some people say by severity of murmur of MR, because murmur of MR is one MR, uh, one murmur, which is usually proportionate to the severity. So MR, uh, intensity of MR is usually proportionate to severity of uh, uh, in MR itself, whether it's rheumatic, non-rheumatic, etc. So if more is the obstruction, more is the contact time between the AMVL and the septum. More is the amount of regurgitation that takes place. If you can find a loud, clear, long, uh, uh, not, uh, the loud murmur of MR in patient with HOCM, then you can suspect that probably you're dealing with a severe obstruction in HOCM. Barring that, I don't think there is any other clinical characteristic that can quantify uh, severe uh, LVOT obstruction versus not so severe LVOT obstruction. Uh, uh, your, your comments as well. I mean... Uh, uh, Dr. Girish, Dr. Smooth, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gupta. Yeah, uh, totally accept uh, your explanation regarding the uh, severity of obstruction. Because uh, as you know that uh, this uh, obstruction itself can be dynamic. So you cannot have one fixed uh, finding. Uh, so this dynamic nature can have different findings on different days or rather different times of examination also. So definitely yes, it's unlike uh, fixed obstruction. This is totally a different ball game. The question that is coming is that it starts uh, was to score required in HCM in patients of uh, in patients of HCM. It's not and validated. Dr. It's not validated. Uh, yeah, so so the answer. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So 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 charge yeah. was two. It's not validated in HCM. Absolutely, there are. Uh, in, I read it somewhere. I don't remember the source where it is clearly written that charge VAS2 is not validated in HCM and it should not be applied. The presence of AF itself, as Dr. Mohit was mentioning in uh, HCM, is itself a big risk factor for these patients because of the cake and you probably need to anticoagulate them because most of them will not have a paroxysmal or a single or a low risk profile. Uh, charge VAS2 ka VASC is already present when he has HCM. So, once a guy has a HCM and an AF, he actually needs an anticoagulation. Yeah, moreover, is it is is usually dilated. Only is usually dilated. So all the more reason to anticoagulate. So very pertinent to note that the guidelines have clearly indicated that charge vest to the decision to anticoagulate and use is independent of the charge vest. Absolutely. So that is very very clear statement. However. 
However, the assert trial that was initially conducted in the patients of HCM, what they have seen is they have just used the CHAT score, and the CHAT score they have categorized that if it is more than one and the atrial fibrillation is present for a longer time, then probably these patients are at higher risk of uh, complications. This particular trial was the only one which has used the initial score. Otherwise, CHAT plus two is personally at 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 present is not indicated in the patients of HCM. Bisperian pulse, uh, you know, of AR and uh, Bisperian pulse of HCM. Uh, you know, can we? <laughs> how can Bisperian bis occurring in AR, atrial regurgitation, and uh, uh, HCM? How are they different? Yeah. So I think I covered that in the slide as well. One is spike and dome, another is quick peaking. So in AS, uh, the spike and dome, the the uh, the problem in HCM is the mid-systolic obstruction, not a high flow obstruction, uh, which you find in bisphereans. In bisphereans, the peak is very uh, rapid and broad. You have a big peak that comes in. That's why you're usually asked to draw both the tracings in the exam. While in HCM, though it's bifid, but it's a spike, short and spike, and then the obstructions are quick fall, quick rise, quick fall, and then the doming with the, because of the second contraction. While in H uh, AS with AR, it is a mid uh, bifid nature of the systolic wave itself. So that's how the two differ. And the mechanism, of course, is the mid systolic complete obstruction of the flow in the spike and dome, gradual plateauing and the doming as you find in HCM. That's how the two differ. One question which has come is uh, uh, regarding MAC to surgical MAC to me. Will it reduce uh, the uh, sudden death uh, chances of that patient? Surgical mace? Myectomy, myectomy. Myectomy, will it reduce the risk yeah. of? Sudden cardiac sudden death. death. Sudden death. Uh, so there are two, two studies. One study actually talks about that the myectomy itself is a scar that you induce in these myocardiums, which itself can be arrhythmogenic. And that's why some people actually advocate doing a EP evaluation for the uh, uh, for the arrhythmia, uh, the halter evaluation post myomectomy, whether to look if they have suppressed or not. But irrespective of arrhythmic events, whether they occur or not, there are enough and ample data to suggest that the longevity is definitely at par with general population post myomectomy, which means to say that arrhythmogenicity, which is the primary driver of mortality in patients with HOCM, is reduced by myomectomy. So most of the trials actually show that the arrhythmic risk goes down. And that's why the longevity over decades, over 35 years now, there is Bono series and Marrow series, that the risk of death is equal to general population in US in patients who are post myomectomy as compared to patients who are not operated. It means that since most of the deaths are aromogenic, they are reduced. LVH due to hypertension versus uh, LVH of HCM uh, differentiation is another question that is being asked. Yeah, cut off of 15, of course, but then as I mentioned, uh, it's not sacrosanct. If you have a genetic phenotype, that's cut off goes down to 13. Um, previously, it was 18. Now, nobody talks about 18. Now, it's 15. But I think if you want to, you're so really confused, the best way to approach it is to do a cardiac MR because that's one modality which will pick up a scar. Your echo may not pick up a scar. So if you do a cardiac MR, you will surely be able to differentiate with your dealing with a essential hypertension versus HCM hypertrophy. If you have 15 with fibrosis, you are dealing with HCM. If you have 15 without uh, the fibrosis, you are not. You can talk about tissue Doppler, spackle tracking, but they all fall into a gray zone. You'll have more in this and less in that, but nothing is exclusive. Fibrosis is pretty much confirmatory and so is genetics. These are the only two things that can confirm a ruler. And this becomes especially relevant because almost 35 to 50 percent of the HCM patients will have associated hypertension. Absolutely. So probably the MR would be a very good modality in this. Any other questions, Dr. Girish? Dr. You told that venturi effect, the germ is being replaced by drag effect. What is a drag effect and what is responsible for the drag? Yeah, so drag is primary. So previously, we used to read a venturi effect. Venturi effect was like sucking in because of the increased turbulence that was happening through the LVOT of a long redundant mitral leaflet. So valve was long, and there is a turbulence in LVOT because of increased force, and hence the leaflet gets sucked in. So that is called venturi effect. Now what they talk about is drag effect. Drag is it's not being pulled, but it is being pushed pushed by the 
the dp by dt of the lv the the force of contraction the spike that you get the force with which the lv pushes the threads uh, into the lvot is so huge the force generated in the initial part of ejection iso in the initial part of the uh, 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 assistly is so huge that it uh, uh, drags the mitral leaflet into the flow rather than being sucked into because of the pressure drop and the turbulence created out of it that is the drag effect so drag effect is not being pulled but by pushed by the lvot itself because of the turbulence and hence then the the, the structural abnormality causing it to impinge on the uh, opposite wall and causing the further worsening of the obstruction why drag effect won't occur in other course of lvot obstruction why not in as why not in uh... subvertic membrane or those kind of obstruction so structural abnormalities are primarily responsible that is the reason so it's the the previous concept that hcm is just the long leaflet and uh, hypertrophied muscle genetically causing obstruction is no more true there is genetic uh, there is a geometric abnormality that exists at the level of apparatus at the level of papillary muscles at the level of muscle insertion at the level of the length of the pep, uh, of the uh, leaflets all of them are basically anatomical abnormalities that are coexistent and genetically coded it's not just the leaflet and the septum which is responsible or completes the spectrum of hcm hcm con constitutes all of these things and that's why i mentioned when you do a myomectomy the myomectomy incision if you extend into the papillary muscle and divide it the likely results are much better than just resecting the muscle out of the septum uh, of the outflow tract so the total pathological abnormality concept of just the long muscle and impinging on the lvot is no more true and that's why you don't get it in L in other disorders like as etc it's the geometrical disorder distortion which is responsible for outflow obstruction okay i think uh, uh, that's a great presentation dr um, and it's as usual always your presentations you, are excellent uh, yeah a lot of material and uh, this presentation will be loaded on our channel so if you want to go through it again you are happy to read it and you know uh, gather the points for your exam dr kamar has also authored a book i uh, will also invite you to catch a copy of it i personally have it a lot of questions concerning exams and everything so it's a great uh, buy and great keep on your cardiology shelf hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is one of the cases that you definitely get in exam and uh, it's one of the cases that also increases a lot of discussion so there is no end to uh, this i would strongly suggest that you read the guidelines and also the new brown wall so that will help you uh, go uh, go through all the uh, nuances and all the recent developments of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy there are newer trials that have come up and especially newer evidences uh, that is also exciting and uh, you should be aware of all those trials and um, that will be fine uh, so thank you dr kamal and thank you dr girish and dr sumoth for joining us for this uh, wonderful journey again as usual every week next week we are going to present uh, uh, dr ramakrishna will be presenting the angiocardiograms in congenital heart disease it will be a focused discussion with all the residents who will be on the panel so i invite you all to join next thursday that will be a great presentation too and uh, next week again we will be having the similar kind of session uh, thank you in task for providing us this platform and uh, stay safe uh, till these times enjoy this at home sitting learning sessions and we'll catch up next week thursday same time uh, with another academy please thank you all so much thank you bye bye thank you for having me